was so blown away by the vibe that was there and how everybody was just so supportive of each other and um, especially the poetry part of just um, how expressive people were. Um, can you expect to um, experience the same thing in New York? Oh, absolutely. I feel like since last February when I had our first meeting, we've been having girls kind of just build friendships just coming to our events and the community is definitely like a real thing and it's it's such a beautiful like it reminds me of like very like 90s old school friendships where people were just happy and like supporting each other and there was no competition amongst women and mm -hmm. the girls are really just trying to learn about their own mental health and they're doing it together which I think is a really beautiful thing. Amazing. What do you think some of the um, experiences or um, differences between, say, a white person being diagnosed with mental health or navigating um, society with mental health or women of colour? What do you think some of the obstacles that women of colour face with um, mental health? Um, yeah. I just, I just think that with, with white women, it's more of something that's accepted. It's been something that is so, it's been so normalised in their... Oh, frozen. mental health there's no one that I felt was representative as a woman of color who was going through depression or any other type of mental illness but was making strides in their career or was still happy and killing it in their careers and just not having that that sense of representation can make you feel really isolated and it might hinder you from speaking about these issues so that's really what I'm trying to build the Stack Girls Club is like building an inclusive space for everyone to be able to talk about these issues and you know, just to make it more normal for women of color, because as we all go through it as humans, there's not a specific race that goes through it more. So we should all be treating it that way, you know? For sure. I, I think one of the first things that um, I experience with my mental health is feeling like a sense of isolation and shame. And I think that really comes from the fact that we don't talk about it and that we're encouraged not to talk about it and it's kind of seen as a weakness so it, it's so it's so good to see especially a woman of color um destigmatizing and um unpacking that um especially with all of the other stuff that we need to go through i think it's quite easy to feel like you're going insane or that you're um <laughs> that you're the problem i think that i right. i I always like took took that on that I felt like I was a problem for speaking about my experiences that somehow I was being divisive. So um, that's amazing. You have been like extremely open about your process, your mental health process, and I just want to know like what encourages you, what encourages you to talk about these things and to keep going because you were kind of one of the people who I was looking at when I began Sad Girls Club. Like, damn, like she's she's doing it, like she's representing it, really? she's standing oh. up. Um, I think, I mean, it's kind of cathartic, to be honest, to speak about it. And I feel like I'm in a position where I would kind of feel like I was holding something back and I was kind of lying to myself if I didn't talk about a big chunk of my actual reality. And unfortunately, it is a big chunk, but I've also come to not be so afraid of my mental health um, issues <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to like kind of be like, oh, okay, well, this is like that. And we recognize this behavior because you've done it before. Um, so <laughs> let, let's try and find a way to work with it and um, think two steps ahead rather than being, you know, um, a victim to it. I think that is a part of me and, um, I think it's always going to be a part of me. So the more that I talk about it, I think it becomes less of a monster and more of just a part of me. Um, like the self-harming um, element um, of what I speak about. I think that I had so much shame about that. And um, I saw a, a meme um, going around about... Um, that was shared by Adwoa Boa for um, Girls Talk. And I just shared it because I was like, okay, well, I don't know if anybody knows that I used to self-harm, but summer's coming up and I know exactly how a lot of people feel. And like my self-harms, I mean, I've got about um, 
about, I don't, I don't know, about uh, four different sections of self-harming scars from like different parts of my life, but they're not noticeable. And I made sure that they weren't noticeable, but for a lot of people, self-harm scars are noticeable. And um, when I feel quite self-conscious about them, like if I'm having sex with somebody and then they ask like, oh, what, where are they from or what are they? Um, so I was like, I saw it and I was like, okay, well, if I feel self-conscious when I'm having sex with somebody, then there's, if someone has self-harm scars that are really noticeable in summer, then that's going to be a really isolating experience. So I guess I just want to be putting information out there that people are going to be receptive to that if I was receptive to it. I guess it's just empathy and just thinking about other people, but relating it to yourself. You do it so well and so effortlessly. Like, yeah. what has the reception been since you've been so open about your mental health? Um, I think, well, I mean, I think as, when I got the tattoo um, over my um, scars on my arm, I got a lot of messages saying, oh, that was really brave to share that because like, there's a big stigma attached to um, self-harming that you must be crazy or that, you know, how could you mutilate yourself like that? And it it doesn't take into consideration the desperation that you must have felt at that point and how um, it's kind of like a, for me, it's a very disassociative experience where between mind and body and um, it is desperate. So, um I don't know. I think that the the response has kind of been a little bit like, oh, I didn't know that you went through that, that you um, were that we that you were that low. That and I, I think the um, documentary people that watched the documentary did spell out a lot, um, especially like having to deal with um, rape really did throw me deeper into depression. Honestly, wow. So. I wanted to ask, well, this is a question for kind of both of us, like, what can we do as women of color to make this, or mental health issues, mental health awareness, less destigmatized? Because I feel like it's definitely something that's happening in the media and every every corporation, they want to talk about mental health issues, but there's a specific way how to, on how to do it. And how can we represent for women of color and people of color in the right way? Um, I think a really important thing to do is even though women of color have a lot of shared experiences, really um, don't lump everybody into the same bracket, if you know what I mean? Because I mean, if we look at how black women are more likely to experience mental health issues than any other woman of color, and then you break that down by like dark skinned women are more likely to experience mental health issues than light skinned women. It's, um, I think it's really important to just really speak in an intersectional way rather than just, um, you know, women of color. I think um, what, I mean, a a lot of what dark skinned women have to deal with. I mean, I'm incredibly privileged as um, a black woman um, and wrongly so for how society views light skin. It's, but I need to acknowledge that. And I need to realize that I don't have to deal with the burden that society puts on the shoulders of dark skinned black women in terms of beauty standards. So I think that when we speak about mental health, you really need to make sure that we're speaking in an intersectional way that acknowledges everybody's experience, not just um, the experience of one, one woman speaking for a very large group of society. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I just think that like mental health affects literally everyone and we need to represent everyone. Mm-hmm. Everyone's affected. I think we can have these conversations like in the home. We need we don't need to go to panels to just have these conversations. I think it should begin in your home and within your friend group asking your friends like how's your mental health today? Yeah. Um and just checking in doing many check-ins and not just making it one big gesture. And I think that's the way we can like eliminate the stigma or at least destigmatize it a little bit every single day. Just check in with your friends, check in with your roommates, check in with your family and and let them know how you're doing as well. Share your experiences if you feel comfortable with it. For sure. So what what kind of like, if you don't mind me asking, what kind of um, techniques have you put into um, like your everyday life to make sure, because like one of the, 
biggest things with me is making sure that I'm regular or consistent with my emotions. Emotions don't always need to be great, but um, if I have a consistency with routine or consistency with just keeping on top of how I feel, um, how what kind of like self care do you exercise? I know that's, that's such a played out question, but maybe not even self care, but like techniques of just keeping um, on top of your oneness. I I just got into journaling recently and. I learned oh, well, that well, that was journaling journaling oh okay yeah. yeah so i learned it at a sad girls club meeting so basically at the at the end of each night i'll write down 10 positive things that happened throughout my day and it's I cho- like i chose 10 or the person chose 10 because it's easy to pick two or three to write down that are that were really positive but you really have to appreciate the small moments throughout your day to come up with 10 especially if you haven't left the house or you haven't even left your bedroom you can just say okay i drink eight glasses of water shout out to me or I cleaned up my room or maybe I saw a really cute dog and you have a and then at the end you have like a log of you know days weeks Mm. months years that you can look back on when you are feeling down like okay I was really down on this day but I really appreciated these things so maybe I can try to go in and do these things again so that's been really helpful and just kind of challenging myself to eat healthy and like eat three times a day it's it's sounds easy but it's like when you have a busy schedule it's it can become something that's secondary so i'm just trying to remain more consistent with my physical health and paying attention more to what i put into my body fast food is easy but is it the best you know and then just also talking to my friends is something that i've become really comfortable with it wasn't something that i was doing before before Mm -hmm. Zagros club just talking about mental health and talking about depression just saying like i really feel like like trash right now Mm -hmm. I just want to vent and like giving myself that space or asking for that space amongst my friend group has been super, super helpful with my friends and family. Yeah. So what do you do? I have some tips too. Oh God. Um, Definitely being vocal with your friends um, and not feeling like you are being demanding by um, saying um, something that you don't feel like that you don't feel comfortable with or that if someone suggests like, I was talking to my friend last night and there's this video that we did. I used to be in a collective called Pussy Palace and um, yes. shout out to the girls if they're watching. Um, <laughs> but um, we were talking about a video that we shot together and it's being um, spliced up and done for something else. And then uh, one of the girls was like, um, actually, like, why don't we just all be in it, but take away the Pussy Palace logo? And then I was like, actually, I would rather not be in it because it's got um, my face in it before I had facial feminization surgery and it's quite triggering for me just in a dysphoria kind of way so i think the best thing to do and then my, all, all of the girls are like okay well 100 percent, that's that's fine and i think if you just open your mouth sometimes and not be afraid of the response um and just think my mental health is more important than somebody else not understanding um and i was so afraid of people not understanding or not getting it when really it doesn't really matter if people don't get it it's as long as you have um fought for your own best interest and um asserted what you feel comfortable with um i think that that's such a key thing is just really opening your mouth um and it's it's easier said than done but i really feel like it's the first step of putting yourself first is not being afraid to um say actually no um and that goes across the board like if you don't feel um comfortable with like if, if you feel like you just want to stay home then don't go out don't, don't feel obliged to other people for um you know, stop trying to please others when you aren't happy yourself. Um, I think that that's, that's so important. I agree. I agree. And it's like the same, I try to think of it now when I say no or cancel plans. Like if I had a broken wrist or I hurt my back, would I still go to a party? So no, if I'm mentally not okay or I'm not feeling like myself, why mm-hmm. would I go out to an event? Why would I do something that will only trigger, like maybe hinder my, my like recovery? So exactly. I just try to think of it like that physical injury 
would I still go to this thing or will I still attend this thing? I mean, I cancel all the time. I'm terrible. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just like, you know what? Like, but like when I say yes to plans now, I'm just like, okay, well, yeah, let's see in a week. Like, cause I don't know how I'm going to feel in a week. (laughs) (laughs) It's off, yes. Next week, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see next week. Um, but I, I, I think it's so important. It's so important to just say no. If you're overwhelmed, no. If you, um, if that person is an energy zap and you don't have the energy to give to them, because we've all got those friends as well. And it doesn't mean that they're not your friend. <laughs> it just means that, you know, sometimes you just don't have enough energy to give to others. So I think it's really putting yourself forward, um, putting yourself first, in a way that um, is good for you as an individual. I, I agree. So do you have any advice for anyone watching here who might have a friend who might be going through something and they don't know how to, how to approach them? What's the best tools for them to approach someone if they've never had the conversation before? Um, if they've never had the conversation about mental health, Yeah, but they want to help out a friend or a family member in need. I think just bear in mind that not every mental health issue is the same. And it really is as unique to the person as their identity. Um, I've got a lot of friends who struggle with mental illnesses from bipolar to um, schizophrenia to... um, to just like, well, even postnatal depression, but one woman's postnatal depression is not going to be the other woman's postnatal depression. So I think the best thing to do is listen to how that person's feeling rather than try and diagnose that person or predict how that person's feeling or try and say that you understand. Because I think that's the most frustrating thing. I think when you're in a real depressive hole, someone saying, I get it, I get it, I get it. And it's like, right. I don't know who do. <laughs> um, especially with self-harming, it's kind of, it's so, I mean, I haven't self-harmed in like two years, but it's um, one person self-harming can be so different to like my self-harming. My self-harming really was attached to my dysphoria. And um, before the dysphoria, it was really because of the rape. And then because of the rape, um, before the rape, it was because of anorexia. So you don't really know how, why someone is self-harming. So saying, oh, don't do it, really doesn't help. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think just listen and try and formulate a way of helping that is that is unique to your friendship. I agree. I agree. So one last question: When you got your tattoos over your scars, yeah, did it hurt? Was it like a liberating feeling once you once you got them? It was like weirdly familiar um, because obviously it's a pain in the area that I self harmed in. Um, so I kind of felt guilty for. I don't know. I like tattoo pain. <laughs> I like tattoo pain. <laughs> I think anyone who's got a lot of tattoos and I got a lot of tattoos. I mean, obviously there's like a, a, a little part of you that enjoys it because I mean, whatever. And I don't think that that's something that should be frowned upon. Some people enjoy pain, whatever. Um, <laughs> um, that, but that's not why I self harm, but or self harmed. Um, but uh, it was a weird kind of sense of excitement because obviously I love getting tattooed, but then also excitement that a negative or an area that I associated with a negative feeling is now something that I enjoy looking at. So, um, it was a real mix of emotions for me in Verida, for anyone that hasn't seen it. That's so dope. My scars are in a similar place. I was, I wanted to get them tatted over. So that advice was really, really helpful. And I know a lot of girls come to me and ask about like tattooing over scars or what they do to kind of like it hide or conceal their scars. And yeah, I mean, it's a real, it's a I wanted mine. I didn't really want mine to kind of go. I, I wanted to merge them and like her scars are. Oh my god, I can't see. 
and so not her scars are like in her body as well so but you I mean you can't see it's less visible it's less visible but um yeah I just feel I feel really I'm in a really good place at the moment I did have a really low day yesterday actually um I felt like really overwhelmed I just had a documentary that came out on channel four um plug 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 <laughs> we watch it on all four um so um i i've been working on that for like four months and i always get um i always get post project like slumps where um i feel like well what next what now i don't have like a thousand things to do in one day or what now um and i don't know i think it's that's just me not being okay to just sit with myself sometimes and just be really okay with everything in my life i guess it's the same as like when i was like at university and i was taking so many drugs and just like not wanting to just sit with myself and be okay with everything in my life um every aspect because it's so much easier to drink or take drugs or to party than just to sit with yourself isn't it yeah for sure and for i sure. think that's that's what i've just been experiencing because i'm so well behaved these days pretty much <laughs> <laughs> i'm just like Life calm, calm. sorry <laughs> So life has calmed down. Life has calmed down. I, I, well, I mean, I don't feel the need to really escape from myself mm -hmm. like I did. Um, every now and again, like, you know, um, like have a big night out and drink myself silly like everybody does. But I, not like I used to. It's, um, it's from a different place. Oh, I must do that. Can you see me? Yeah, I lost you for a second, but I won't repeat. Okay. <laughs> I just said that, like, I'll, I'll have, like, a big night out and get drunk and whatnot, but it's because, you know, to have fun. And I'll regret it in the morning like everybody does, but before it was to numb the way that I was feeling. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I need to ask you some more questions. When are you coming back <laughs> over to the UK with um, Sad Girls Club? Because I want to get involved again. Yes, absolutely. I'm planning to come this summer. So July is mid July is where, where I'm aiming to come. When I'm aiming to come. So you definitely have to like show July. Me yeah. Oh, I'll be back. I, I'm going to be in June as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in June. I'm going to be in New York in June for the Team Vogue Summit. Oh my gosh. Okay, maybe we can do something there. My my intern is going to and I'm, I might I might head there as well. Oh, amazing. So we can link up. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Okay, well, um, what else? I want to ask you some more stuff. Um, how do you feel as a society we can instigate change when it comes to how we speak about mental health, say in like the media or schools? How do you think, what do you think the first steps are? Uh, okay, so as far as the media goes, I feel like we've had for the long laugh and make fun of people who struggle with mental illnesses and, and like famous people, actresses, we have the permission to point fingers and laugh at their conditions. And I think that's something that really needs to stop. Um, it's something that's like glorified. Like for example, when Kanye West acts up, it's like a funny thing when he probably has an actual mental illness and Amanda Bynes a few years ago when she was going through her stuff. I was gonna say Amanda Bynes. It was like a big thing. And then Britney Spears back in the day, like we've always had permission to make fun of people when they're breaking down mentally. And I think that's something that absolutely needs to stop and it, it needs to stop like ASAP. And I think that companies can just do things like this, like having conversations like this, educating the, like our communities little by little is gonna help out so, so much. Like we have so many young girls who look up to us and they might not be having these conversations in their home. So just being able to mm. log onto the phone and get this advice, get these tips, is gonna be super fruitful. Um, in like society, I just think that we need to, we can be a lot more kind to people we don't know. Mm -hmm. I was at a panel, at Woe's panel actually, um, Girls Talk, and someone spoke on the panel and they said that we treat dogs and puppies that we don't know nicer than like our friends and people in our neighborhoods. And I was like, that's so true. Like I see a small dog and I run up to it and I give him all my love, but I don't do the same for someone walking down the street and they might have a bit of a grudge. So I think that we can, you know, 
try to treat people like small puppies. Well, we and, also you know, like don't ap- we also apologize for misgendering small dogs. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but we exactly. don't apologize for misgendering human beings. <laughs> <laughs> So it's so real and it's like we are like we we have the power and i think this generation is the generation that's going to turn things around so just continuing to have these conversations and putting putting it right there in your face like you can't ignore this issue anymore we're all talking about it we all want to talk about it we all want to be destigmatized so let's do it now you know and i think just having voices like us being vulnerable keeping the conversation going connecting with each other and keeping these conversations growing is going to definitely help amazing Amazing. I completely, completely agree. That whole Amanda Bynes situation and Britney Spears situation was so bad. And Whitney Houston yeah. as well. Yes. Mainly, like, a, like you, you, like, just being, having a little bit of a platform, I go through things. So I can only imagine if the whole world is looking at you and you already have something and you're trying to hide it or suppress it, and then you just have a mental breakdown and the whole world is looking at you, laughing at you, making memes mm-hmm. and hashtags, it's like like where does, where does it end you know where does it end and then something really bad happens and we want to be reactive instead of proactive so i think we can just work on being more proactive and you know trying to just have these conversations sooner i think it also comes down to list it does come down to listening and believing people doesn't it because mental health is largely invisible until it's too late um yeah. because when it starts becoming visible is when it's like really got a hold so um, I just really want people to just, I mean, we need more counseling services. I, when I was in school, we didn't have a counselor. We didn't have like a, a, um, someone that was looking like a, a what do you call it in America? Like, like a guidance counselor in school? That's it, like yeah. Class? Yeah, we, yeah. Didn't, we never had that. So um, I think that it's really important that guidance counselors especially are involved in in the education process in the UK, because why don't we have anyone that, I mean, I don't know if we do now, but certainly when I was at high school, there definitely wasn't anybody that you could speak to, um, especially with the added pressures of the internet, um, whereas it's it's great that we've got safe spaces and um, forums that people can get involved in. But I think that they can, ob- they can also be quite toxic areas sometimes because, um, you know, not everybody knows how is best to speak or um, deal with their um, illnesses. It's so I think to speak to an impartial person who has some great advice is um, always needed. I agree. I agree. And we definitely can do a lot within our school systems to have these conversations. In the States, they're literally eliminating all health classes. We don't even have any mental health conversations but they're eliminating just health classes in general so how are you going to learn about sex how are you going to learn about how to treat what you know? are they <laughs> like really not, like so being eliminated and it's like i know new york state is being more proactive with including health classes or mental health courses in their new curriculums but i think it's something that needs to change like globally and immediately because we're the most depressed generation so like we need help we need help it's the statistics are there the numbers are there and it's 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 not i feel like it's not up to just us it's up to the government to kind of help us out too so we just need to all be proactive in making sure these things are in place and we're putting people in places that can help us and help our communities for sure definitely definitely i think i mean the fact that we're the most depressed generation says that the way that we do the way that things are going isn't working i know that especially in the uk with the amount of like cuts that have come from austerity from the awful theresa may um (laughs) i mean yeah it's just it's terrible i mean you've got cuts to youth services you've got cuts to um the nhs so it's just where does it end um we just need to find a way that people can at least just talk about it because that's i really feel like just talking about it for me i speak about it in the media but i also get something out of that because i feel like it's a burden that's off of my shoulders and being able to help somebody else um who's listened to that advice or listened to me just venting i feel like i'm actually helping make a small change in whatever way so i don't know i feel like we need to just think of some new ways that Theresa May can't cut. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. I totally agree. 
do you have any other questions or any ad like last minute advice for anyone who just tuned in or let me look um da -da 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 -da. I don't think I do, you know. Um, give me one piece of advice for anybody who thinks that they may have a mental illness, like where to go from here. Like someone who hasn't I been diagnosed. Okay. I would I give two answers for this. Okay. So if you have a support group, like if you have a best friend, someone you trust, an aunt, a parent, start the conversation with them. Say, this is how I'm feeling. These are my emotions. This is what I'm going through. Can you help me? You know, just, just talk about your emotions. Like you said, having the conversation is like the most uplifting part. And if you do have health care, a lot of people in the States don't, but if you do have health care and you have a health care provider, have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Having an impartial person, as you mentioned before, can be super fruitful. And like, just knowing that, I think it's like kind of uplifting to have it, to be diagnosed. Like, you know what's going on with you. You're not questioning, you're not mm -hmm. in the dark. And you can also find support groups once you know what you have, once you know what you're going through. So you can find clubs like Sad Girls Club and you can say like, okay, I have this thing. Now I have this group I can talk to. And just finding those support groups, which I think are, blossoming a lot on the internet, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful thing anyone can join. Like find find your group, find someone who's speaking to you, find things that make you feel good and have those conversations with those groups of people who are like-minded and who understand you truly. Excellent. That's so good. And there's so, there's so many amazing different groups out there as well. Um, I mean, Sad Girls Club, when we did Lon when you did the London um, event and I came and um, spoke on the panel, the amount of different girls and the um girls and jordan <laughs> um that were there it was just so diverse and such a range of um experiences and also people were just talking about um things that i felt quite sh ashamed about in the past um so yeah, it was just really nice to kind of hear like that turned into humor and um, a way of coping. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Amazing. Well, um, I have one question for you. One more. Oh, Where can oh, we watch your documentary in the States? Sorry? Where can we watch your documentary in the United States? Um, we're working on that at the moment um, because the license it needs to be rejigged around in terms of like some of the music licensing and because of um, basically it needs to be bought by a different company yeah. for uh, we're working on something so I don't know whether or not it'll be like a streaming service or whether or not it will go to um, a um, network television um, station we'll, we'll 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 find out but we're working on it. Um, oh god, this person is really going in on me in the comments. <laughs> Bang, I was like, okay. <laughs> it's this as well, isn't it? It's kind of like exposure to online hate's kind of like quite difficult, and um, yeah, so yeah, you can find the most positive thing, and then there's always that one <laughs> person. But like, I'm how are you sure talking to <laughs> I'm pretty sure they need this. They need this more than anyone else watching, for sure, which is why they're probably in here. <laughs> Gotta be a special kind of person to call someone speaking about their depression a dumb bitch. So, right, right. What's she gonna do, eh? Um, but yeah, so we're working on getting it um, an international um, license. So keep in there. But um, okay. if I see you in June, I'll show you anyway. <laughs> yeah, please. Please, please, please. This was such a good conversation. I'm happy I got to speak with you. Oh, no, I'm so happy that I got to speak with you too. And um, I'll see you in June.